I am former. I am a former TAO operator. So if you guys haven't heard, NSA has a program called Tailored Access Operations, where essentially they have certified operators that chase down terrorists and, and things of that nature. Uh, I was doing operations in TAO through mid 2011. When I was at TAO, I was responsible for running counterterrorism operations as the technical director for CT. Uh, so I bring a, a fresh perspective, I'd say, to kind of the cyber defensive realm. And what I'd like to talk about today is, is walk through what is hunt operations and kind of the concept and the way that we see it inside Route 9B. Uh, let me give you a little background on who Route 9B is. So we are, we are a commercial entity. Uh, what makes us unique is I have more than 40 former TAO operators on staff conducting operations for our clients. Um, as part of it, we provide several different services. So we started out in the training realm, training for us being focused around operational execution. So we teach, we teach students how to exploit, how to maintain tradecraft, how not to get caught, and then we teach them how to go and defend against those same capabilities. So bypassing security products, then how to use the security product or use open source capabilities to go through and find, find them. We have an emerging technologies division. Emerging technologies is product development. So I have everything from a hunt platform, which I'll show you guys to, to, uh, today, through to a credential assessment capability, as well as a couple other unique capabilities that we provide to our commercial clients. We have cyber operations. Cyber operations for us is really focused around hunt operations. Using folks that understand how an adversary maneuvers will remote into a client's infrastructure and then actively engage uh, to get into a cyber knife fight with an adversary, essentially. We're looking for those folks that are bypassing your EDR platforms. Um, in addition to that, we do all your traditional IT security stuff. So pen testing, vulnerability assessments, malware analysis, everything that the industry's been doing for the last 20 plus years, we roll that up in there as well. Threat intelligence, we're, we're not a threat feed. So what my threat intel team is, is made up of a, a group of analysts that have conducted operations in the past, and really what they provide is threat knowledge. So they'll sit there, they lurk in the dark web, they've created seasoned personas, they become friends with organizations like Anonymous, and then they sit there and monitor their IRC chats, identify if they're gonna uh, potentially launch a campaign, and then they take that data and they roll that back into our clients. Sorry, I'm holding two different mics here. And then we have network defense operations. So network defense operations is really managed security services or MDR services for the organization. We never, we didn't initially intend to move into that space. We were really looking to be a hunt provider. But what was happening is as I was coming in, many of my clients would have an MSS provider already. We wouldn't tell the MSS provider that we are coming and then we deploy our payloads across the environment without pre-configuration. And the MSS provider wouldn't see us. And so then the clients started to get themselves into a spot where they said, well, wait a second, if Route 9B is able to essentially exploit onto my machine and navigate through my network and I'm not being told, then what service are you providing for me? So in a lot of cases, they started to move away from the MSS and gave us the data, which has really been fantastic because it allows for us to focus our hunt operations. Um, the last kind of bullet point here that I want to talk about is to, to us in Route 9B, cyber security, well, let me step back. If I look at the majority of organizations that are, say they are cyber security companies, what I'd say is that 98% of them are IT security firms that have rebranded because the word cyber is sexy and there's money tied to it. To us in Route 9B, cyber security is the convergence of IT security, OT security, and intelligence all brought together. Without intelligence, it's just IT security and OT security. And so for us, everything we do inside the organization has an intelligence aspect to it. We're constantly learning and then rolling that back in, into the capabilities. I, I think this has gone a long way, especially here in Canada with Sapper Labs. We recently just won Defense Ideas. And so we'll be providing some attribution type work to the Canadian government. All right. Let's step into the, the real discussion now. So this slide up here 
Everyone's seen it. It's traditional defense in depth. If you go through, you get your degree or you take CISSP, this is what's being touted as the way to secure your environment. As we follow this, all we keep doing is stacking technology on top of each other in the current environment today. So we're taking an IDS, we take EDR platforms, we basically will add perimeter security products. But the problem is, it's not really helping. It's not stopping the JP Morgans from being breached. An adversary is still getting in because the adversary understands that we are going to secure ourselves in this manner and that we're gonna follow specific compliance rules and everything else and effectively, we are creating a playbook for the adversary to be able to maneuver and exploit your operating environment. In addition, by stacking technology on top of each other, what we're finding in the security industry is that many cases when you deploy maybe an antivirus and an EDR together, that you're actually creating additional vulnerabilities that you didn't know about. Or, and by bringing these uh, capabilities in, it's allowing the adversary to use those to their advantage. If we were to take a look and put it in a physical model here, essentially what we've done is we've created a secure perimeter and the, the model we've gone after is stop the adversary from ever getting in. You will never ever achieve that. You can try all that you want, but an adversary is going to breach your network. Security has to adapt from trying to stop them from being able to gain initial access to stopping them from getting to their motive. Don't allow them to get to their critical infrastructure. Effectively, by putting firewalls and IDSs and IPSs and just sticking them on the outside, once you get spearfished, it's 1995 hacking at its finest. Net use past the hash for the win, right? So we've essentially allowed our internal, our internal networks to be a soft, squishy center. We've conceded that space in the security environment today. This slide, I think, is the evidence of what I'm talking about. In every one of these cases, what I'd say if I, if I went up to that CISO, he probably had whatever the newest technology was, the prob and the technology probably actually saw it or caught it, but didn't necessarily stop it. No one is complaining that they don't have enough data. Everyone has too much data now. The problem is no one knows what to look for because we're trying to stop everything as opposed to being focused around our infrastructure, around our networks. Let's consider a few things here. When we take a look at it from an attacker perspective, in my previous life, when I was exploiting or going after a target, I would initially perform reconnaissance. I would go through and I'd find a way that, to go and enable access for myself in that operating environment. Once I ended up gaining access after I did recon and exploit it onto the target, the next thing that I would do is I would go steal their security settings. I would basically take what antivirus, what EDR product do they have? What passive technologies do they have around me that potentially could catch me when I'm maneuvering through the network? I would then take that I would come back into a virtual environment and I'd recreate that operating environment. That would allow for me to know that if I do A and B as an attacker, security product will do C. So I'll do A and D so that I can maintain access. I would then continuously monitor that target to go through and identify what security mechanisms are they going to put in place or changes are they putting. And then before they could deploy those, I would go and put those in inside my little virtual environment or my lab, and I would test again. And that would allow for me to maintain persistent access on my targets for several years at a time. It allowed for me to continuously outmaneuver the, out the defender because they would go through their testing components as well, and then that would, that would allow for me to, to be successful. Now, I give you that, that background here because the attacker has a motive. The attacker has a methodology. The attacker is a human that understands how to get around the automated security products that you're putting in place. What we are not doing as defenders is we are not matching the attacker on the playing field. We're not putting another human defender 
maneuvering through the network, ready to engage. As a former attacker, there was no, no pain caused to me. Once I got into your environment, if I lost a payload or I lost some specific capability, that was fine because I could continuously go through and maneuver. There was really no fear. And I would not use my O-Day in every single instance. I would use whatever the lowest possible capability was, 1995 hacking, net use, right, like I said. I would use that every chance I could once I was in the network so that I wouldn't burn my capabilities. So really that bullet point there, humans are thinking, right? They're adapting. Your attacker is adapting to your network environment. It's time that as security professionals, we start adapting our network environments to the attackers. I pretty much already hit on this point. Really, the one I want to drive home is kind of that last bullet point. The chief scientist at Route 9B, Dave Oxsmith, he does quite a bit on uh, trying to secure airplanes and submarines and everything else. And I thought his quote at a, at a conference not too long ago was spot on. We're, likely, we're as likely to build a secure computer system as we are to build an aircraft that cannot be shot down. In this environment, we are being challenged by sophisticated adversaries, whether it's an organization like Anonymous or a nation state adversary like a Russian APT. Yet we are, and you are, are in control of your operating environment and responsible for the security of that environment. Yet we are not spending or putting the, the ability for our people to be able to defend the network appropriately. One of the, one of the kind of concepts, I think, it's almost like asking our people to stand on the front line without a gun. We wouldn't do that in the military, so why are we doing it with computer networks and environments? All right, so what is hunting? So there's a lot of concepts out there, and it's a very muddied word for anyone that's heard of threat hunting. Organiz there's a couple different takes. Some organizations look at it as event log analysis. That is not hunting to me. It's a necessary requirement when you're doing security, but going through and doing event log analysis is an after-the-fact uh, analytics environment that causes you then to go and respond. Um, additionally, what, what I find some folks saying threat hunting is, is looking at network traffic after the fact. In fact, there's one financial institution that has hunt parties once a month. So every 30 days they have a hunt party and they look through all their logs and then when they identify a potential breach, they go and make a change. That is no different than what we were doing in the early 2000s. That is still not hunting to me. So the way that I see hunting is it's maneuver warfare in your own operating environment. It's allowing humans to go through and look for an adversary bypassing your security products and then actively engage the adversary. Find them, fix it, and finish, right? That's really what hunting is. It's about allowing a human to go through your environment and patrol through their space, looking for that 5% or 7% of sophisticated attackers that know how to bypass those products or to maneuver in your operating environment. There's some things to consider. Defenders actually understand their network, or they should. I'll take that back. They should understand their network. We know what reality is. So they actually, they have the advantage. The problem is, attackers, when they come in, they have to learn your environment, and they will take whatever that kind of soft uh, squishy center is and maneuver to that machine. But they're there for a motive. They're not exploiting every single box. When I would exploit into an environment, I knew what I was coming for. Maybe it's the domain controller. Maybe I want to steal source code. Maybe I want some PII data. And I will navigate to the machines that are housing those. I'm not doing like the defender's doing and trying to go through and look at it logs from every single endpoint that I have in that, in that environment. They're very strategic, very tactical. So let's look at this model again. What I'm proposing and what I propose for Hunt is putting the human back at the center of the operations. 
So if you take a look here, let's pretend that this was a physical model. I'll use a, being former military, I'll use a military installation. If I was driving up to a military installation for a meeting, as I start driving to that installation, I'm going to see a fence going around the compound. There's going to be barbed wire on top of the fence. There's going to be a camera probably in every single corner that I go to. I'll pull up to the front gate. The guard's going to be there checking my ID to make sure I can come on. He's probably going to have a gun. And there's going to be a barricade stopping me from being able to just drive on through. After they check my access and verify that I can get on to that base for legitimate reasons, they'll allow me to drive through that compound. As I drive through, I'm probably going to pass military troop formations, maybe some armored vehicles, more cameras, um, more control, controlled buildings on there. So in that model there, in, in that physical model that I just described, the fence and the barbed wire are not going to stop me from gaining access. If I want to get over the 13-foot fence, I bring a 14-foot ladder, right? Every one of those components, though, are there to help enable the defender. The camera is providing telemetry to let them know whether or not I actually was able to, to get on. And if I now put that back to cybersecurity and the way we're doing it today, all that we have is we have basically that fence and that barbed wire, and then we have someone monitoring the camera, and then when there's a breach, they call someone and then someone goes and shows up. There's no one actively going through and making sure that there's uh, an, not an attacker already gaining access. And so what you look at here is this is how I see cybersecurity really coming together. A true cybersecurity approach would have, one, a good training foundation, but two, you would have an attack surface baseline. You would attempt to come after yourself the way the adversary would, not just doing an expose uh, basically launch an expose and then dump out the 400 page report. It's helpful, but it's not really security, right? Instead, what I, what I propose is understanding how an adversary would come after you, understanding the groups that are most likely to attack you, and then testing against your perimeter products to make sure they can't bypass. Next, everyone has, pretty much everyone has a SOC nowadays, right? Or they're all headed that way. So you have managed security services that are collecting data from your EDR platforms, from your WEF forwarding, your syslog data, whatever have you. All of that is really good data. That allows for you to identify that someone's there and then respond. That's traditional, traditional security. As you get into the center here, this is really where the crux comes in of, of Hunt. Hunt is putting a human back at the center of the operations, as I had mentioned, and allowing them to navigate, look for an adversary, and then actively engage in your operating environment. And so the way that I propose Hunt to happen is using an offensive-minded approach. Sit back the way an attacker would and navigate through your environment looking for an anomaly. As you identify the anomaly, it then turns into an incident response and forensic type investigation. Now, in this approach, though, with Hunt, what I'm not talking about is you, you were not hunting one million machines all at the same time. That's what an antivirus is for. Instead, what I'm talking about is understanding your business context. Understand your critical infrastructure, realizing that it could be multiple things. Assume that an attacker, when they compromise you, is going to navigate to that path. So when you're hunting in that type of environment, you hunt the critical infrastructure and slowly peel back the layers, hitting different network segments, looking for anomalies that are taking place, and then come up with a plan to actively engage. Now, in addition to that, you see there's a threat intel line that goes through. Threat intel feeds each of these components. I talked about the attackers are adapting to your environment. Once they identify that you bought product X, they figure out their way around, and that's how they're going to come, come in. What defenders need to do is they need to be able to adapt to the attacker. Instead of chasing file paths and signatures from a threat intel feed, you should be understanding why they would come after you, where they would try to maneuver, and focus your energy there. By being able to, to be focused there, the threat intel will constantly end up changing the way that you implement your security 
practices and mechanism. So adversary pursuit to us is allowing for an interactive operator to sit in a SOC-like environment and execute operations. It's proactive in its approach. It's going back and making sure that your investments that you've put in to your EDR products and your AVs and everything else, that they're actually finding what they should be. And if they're not, it's allowing for you or the human to do the active engagement, identify, and respond. The way we cause pain to an adversary is by burning his capabilities, forcing him to go different paths. When it's hard on the, on the attacker, the attacker will go to a different network. I, I mentioned this already. When you're, when you're conducting hunt operations, if I was doing a forensic investigation, I have a patient zero. That's what caused me to go in and do that investigation, right? There's something there that is forcing me to look at it. It's a post-mortem. Incident response, I have a patient zero as well. I had something that's causing me to elevate it to become an incident. When you're doing hunt operations, everything's a patient zero. You need to assume that your network is already compromised and that the adversary is, is going to maneuver to take your data or whatever have you. Hunt will always lead to an incident response investigation. If you're proactive, then you should be finding adversaries in your network, and then you should be coming up with a plan to be able to go and execute. We have a retail client that gets breached every single month. No lie. Every single month, they have a breach. But they're conducting proactive operations, and the adversary has never been able to get to their end goal. Now, as I mentioned earlier, I don't ever tell a client, we are going to stop them from being breached, because it's impossible. What we do is we focus when we're hunting, again, around keeping them from being able to live in the operating environment for whatever the new stat is, 140 days or so. So in order to execute hunt, you need to have a methodology. The methodology really needs to be focused, again, around the human defender being in that operating environment and having full freedom of movement and full control to actively engage. They need the attacker to start looking over their shoulder when they're exploiting in. The way that I see hunt operations is through a, a basically a four-step approach. First, phase one, in mass collection. You could do that today with EDR products. You could do it today through WMI, whatever you have. You could use those capabilities to reach out and collect. Now, when you're pulling it back, instead of looking for signatures, you should be looking for anomalies. The easiest way to do this when you're hunting Understand your network, right? Get a baseline, build a baseline, because you probably don't have a gold image, so build a baseline, and then from there, do comparisons of your collection against those baselines. As you go through and you're pulling back data through the in-mass collection, that's going to lead into ultimately what's the second phase, identification of an IOC, indicator of compromise. That's gonna give you an anomaly to go and start to do the investigation for. Now, all of this that I'm talking through, I'm talking about doing it remotely, doing it interactively from a centralized location, executing against host in your environment. From there, after you identify the IOC, it becomes targeted collection and forensics. Now, much of that, much of those first three steps that I just kind of alluded to are in many people's incident response plans today. They're just not doing it continuously, going through the network in a stealthy manner, looking for the adversary. Finally, the thing about hunt, so those first three, there is a plethora of organizations that say they hunt and only do those. That is collection. It's a subset of what hunt is, but what hunt really is, is response activities. That's how I see hunt. This would be, for any of you that that actually hunt animals, and I hate using this analogy, but it's a good one. It, this component 
we don't call hunt, let, let me step back, we don't call hunt in, the, in that space sticking a GoPro in a tree stand and then going back and checking it. That is not hunt. We need that data. But in cybersecurity, that's very much what we're doing, right? That's that event log analysis I'm talking about after the fact. And that's what, what some folks are calling hunt. What hunt is, is having a human there with a rifle ready to shoot. That human is going to be disguised, going to be stealthy, going to try to blend into the environment so that he can target his prey. This is what I'm talking about in cybersecurity. Hunt requires a response activity, and it requires essentially a methodology of how you're going to, to interact. That methodology is going to be different for every single person in this room and for every business based off of context. In order to be successful, organizations need to build a common platform for themselves. Now, there's a number of different capabilities out there that allow for, for you to be able to go through and execute hunt operations. CrowdStrike Falcon would be a good EDR platform for you to be able to go through and start doing those types of, of activities. What they do is when you're doing this, you should be doing it more stealthy. So predominantly or preferably, you would not have a persistent agent that was sitting there for the adversary to see. And the reason I say that is if you think back to what I explained the way I used to attack, I would steal that persistent agent's capabilities and figure out how am I going to go through and maneuver. So it should be an agentless technology that's being used by a human defender to execute. You also don't want to automate everything. Automation is good. Technology is good. You need it. But you can't automate the human. The human attacker will figure out what those response activities are going to be. The end goal is really to try to cause pain to that adversary, but focus on not allowing them to get to their intended target. So we need to think like the adversary and maneuver like the adversary. We need to be stealthy in the approach and very tactical in the engagement of how we are going to, to take them out once we identify them. Some additional things, I hit on a bunch of these already. You want the ability to be able to detect and engage the attacker. So when the attacker is there, you want to be able to get into the cyber knife fight with them. You want to be able to get into that hand-to-hand -hand combat so that the, the attacker is now on the defensive. He's trying to figure out what can he do, what should he do, where does he go from there. The capability also shouldn't be only is solely focused around Windows and Linux machines. Really, any capability or platform that you have should be able to pull off of a pacemaker if you want to, or an internet, some Internet of Things, maybe a satellite hop. You should be able to engage any one of those environments, collect data, and correlate it in a unified platform so that you can have visualization. Back to the, the automated piece, I often get asked why we didn't go fully automate it. And I'll, I'll save you from going through all the bullet points on the slide. But at the end of the day, it's exactly what I said. The human will figure out what the response activity is going to be from the automated platform. And so any, any capability you have, you need to really combine those two. The human has to be able to engage with the technology so that they can actively, actively pursue that adversary. When you're doing operations like this as well, I guess I should have said earlier, when you're conducting hunt operations, the nice thing about hunt and this approach is you control all of the assets already if you're a corporation. And so you can reach in your environment, collect data, and pursue adversaries and engage them without violating any laws. You can also passively collect data or intelligence beyond the wire, beyond your perimeter, to see are they coming after you. And then you can take that data and you can actually start to hand it over to people with the appropriate authority, like an FBI or, or something to that effect, where they can, act, they can go beyond and take it to uh, prosecution. Let's talk about a couple concepts, and then I'll, I'll show you guys a product. There's this agent versus agentless um, concept that I, I want to hit on. So I talked about persistent agents. Many of you already have a persistent agent 
inside your environment. Think of it like an antivirus type solution. Those capabilities are good, but they are defeatable. I hope I'm not telling anyone something new there, right? Those capabilities are defeatable. A good adversary is going to figure out how, how to get around. So the agentless approach that I'm talking about is really just-in-time execution concept. You don't want to be residing on the box constantly because the adversary, when they get there, will identify what that technology is and then go back and do, do testing. So by being able to hunt with an agentless approach, you are maintaining the ability to stealthily maneuver through that network so the adversary does not know you're there and deliver capability just in time. So really just shoving something out to the machine, executing, collecting data, pulling it back. There's some advantages to that. Advantages being if it's done right, you can have global reach to any product that's out there, as well as it gives significant amounts of scalability. Um, uh, talk through this. The, you have no persistence, and it's harder for the adversary to know that it's there. And in most cases today, they're not looking over their shoulder. Um, any hunt platform that gets developed, I talked about, should have a response activity. But you should have the ability to be able to collect metadata, pull back files, be able to parse memory remotely over the wire, um, and then be able to really, again, respond. Uh, two, two other concepts I want to hit real quick. In an exploit, when the attacker throws an exploit and gains, uh, gains access, there's really two parts to any exploit. There's the vulnerability, which in most cases is the spear phishing. It's the end user, right? There's the vulnerability, and there's the payload. When the exploit gets delivered, if there's no payload attached, then all you're going to have is an exploit that does nothing. The payload is the real special sauce in that exploit environment. And that could be anything from a denial of service through to an implant through to what it, whatever they're looking to achieve. So very important concept because what is being used in most cases is they will take that payload and use it over and over again. And if it's a well-written payload infrastructure with polymorphism built in, then they're going to be able to maintain access in your environment for a long period of time. Second concept I want to talk about real quick is the concept of a stager. So for those of you that, that aren't really technical, um, when an exploit gets delivered and the payload gets executed, back in 1995, we would basically throw the exploit and, and the payload, and everything would be on the target. From a forensic standpoint, the forensic investigator would come up, they'd take a memory image, or they'd take a live memory image, and they knew all of my capability, right? So what the attackers started to do is move to a staging infrastructure. And so what it is, is it allows for a modular uh, type environment. So when I throw my first exploit and I gain access, that stager will call back and execute some code. Typically, when it calls back, it'll grab what we call the stage, right, and insert that directly into memory. So if you've written from an attacker perspective, if I've written a good first stage, then I'm going to be able to maintain access. For example, everyone probably has heard of Metasploit. Metasploit works off of a stage, Meterpreter works off a stage type infrastructure. If I rewrite the first stage, like I, I do in Python and things like that, I bypass whatever the endpoint security product is, allowing for me to have access. And then I can use traditional Meterpreter capabilities. Now, when you do this, in today's environment, most hackers allow for their code base to stay directly in memory. So they will inject into memory all of their modules. So if they have a hash dump module, a Mimikatz module, whatever have you, all of those are already stored. So from a defensive perspective, it's easy on a forensic investigation to go back and see what capabilities they had available to them. Now, if it's done properly, they will have multiple stages. They will only execute what they need at a given time so that they're not burning all of their capabilities in one shot. You guys following that? All right. So in summary there, before I, I show you guys a platform, 
really, well, what I propose is putting the human in an, act, in an offensive type manner to provide defense. Allow the human defender freedom of movement inside your environment and give them, take their handcuffs off and let them engage. All right, give me one second. So what, what I'm showing you here, this is Route9B's version of a hunt platform. Now, there's, as I mentioned, there's a plethora of capabilities out there, right, that we've built our own, but you could use WMI, you could use Metasploit if you want, really you could use any type of, of capability. But I wanna walk you guys through the concept of a hunt operation as I just kind of described it, so that you can see some of the benefits. So once I authenticate here, what we have is, the way we've designed it is we've given role-based access as part of the platform. So when any user that ends up logging in, they can have individualized payloads. So from a training perspective, what we do is I have apprentice, journeyman, master level, and then what we do is we allow the apprentice maybe only one task to be executed. And then as they graduate through their individual training plan, we can add additional capabilities. We work off of the concept of operations, is the way that we do it today. So what an operation is, is it could be, really could be anything that you define, but I could say I wanna do a new operation and company X is that new operation. And then underneath company X, I might have VLAN one through VLAN one million and one. And I, I can now create individual baselines as part of those sub-children operations and then roll them back up. So it allows for quick comparison for the operator to identify any anomalies that are inside their environment. We have a couple different components here. I've created a countermeasures operation already. You have collections. Collections is exactly that, doing some form of collection against the, the endpoint that you wanna, you wanna target. Analysis is, is basically just rolling it all up for you to find an anomaly quickly and then you have your management things here, reporting and auditing. Every good product needs a reporting tool. <coughs> so inside collections here, I'm gonna dig up there. Inside collections here, I can go through and I can specify a delivery mechanism to find targets however I want. So I could literally use Nmap if I wanted to find a targets list and then populate targets that way. We have one built in or organizations can use whatever capability they want to, to go and find those. Similarly, everything that we deliver, we call a payload. So a payload back to that staged infrastructure standpoint I talked through, we shove a stager over and then we directly inject code into every machine to collect. We then exfil over an encrypted named pipe back to our database and then we, we visualize that data. We are acting like the attacker inside of the environment. Payloads can be both local and remote. So I can dump out a payload, take it, and double click it on an endpoint and get the data, or I can remotely deploy it, and so that I can go and pull back data sets. In that concept, if, I had, if your organization had a Tanium or something like that, we would just deploy the payloads over top of what's already been approved. Or similarly, you can blend in and use just WMI or WinRM or whatever, whatever you want against Windows machines. You can add endpoints as part of the environment so I'm not gonna give you guys everything in the product here, but you can add endpoints, I can query domain controllers, and then populate a list of hosts. And that's what you have here. I can specify credentials. So this is called evil core. And then I can validate targets are alive. And so inside here, what it's doing is it's gonna go through, it'll tell me whether or not I have any targets up for a collection standpoint. 
and then I can go through and I can start to specify, as targets come up, I can specify the payload collection capabilities. And so these are all swappable. So for organizations that have their own defer kits or their own incident response um, or own collectors, you roll those in and it becomes a payload infrastructure that gets delivered just in time for execution. It's literally a shopping cart menu approach to deploying payloads and pulling back data sets. All data, I'll say from executing the payload, I did some analytics here already. All data comes back into the analysis engine and through this analytic engine here, we conduct baseline. So I can build out, I could take an NSRL image, essentially take NSRL and load that into the database and then do comparisons of hashes or file paths of target operating systems. What I'm looking for in those environments is an anomaly. If I run a hunt operation against a Windows machine today and then I run it again tomorrow and solitaire is up, that's gonna present an anomaly to me or something that's different. Similarly, I can compare operations against each other to say, show me what's different from, from previous. Now, as it comes back into the database, we made it easy. We put the virus total up here once you click on a hash. Or similarly, you can consult the Oracle, Google. And all of those are swappable. Everything in this interface that I'm doing is a RESTful API. So to the automation, to the folks that love automation, yes, it can be automated. Now, as we go through, one of the big differentiators we have in our product is I have the ability to remotely deploy a payload and parse memory live on the system. So I can see if someone did a DLL inject on, a, on an operating system or if they did a write process memory technique using obfuscated shellcode, similar to what Chinese APTs do. And so inside here, if I click on one of these hosts, I can actually say, Show me every, uh, give me one second. I actually clicked on the host, sorry. So what I just did there is I clicked on a specific box that I know has malware because I deployed the malware in there. It's actually a Chinese C2 server um, that I have, call, I'll call on home to a Chinese C2 server. What you have here is you have the targets. Every time you do a collection, it gets a unique GUID and then it comes back with their host name. Now, on the right-hand side, what I said is, go ahead and show me processes that have anomalies. So what we did is we took the Windows core, we took uh, Linux uh, kernels, we went back and said, if we were going to gain execution, what are all the ways that we would gain execution? And then we built the product to catch ourselves effectively. And so what you'll see here is, in this particular instance, I can identify that bandwidth L has the green checks means an anomaly in each one of those components. So if you guys are wondering what, what does that consist of, well, if you see the RWX component there, that's read, write, execute permissions in the, in the binary. I also see that there's PE, portable executable format, telling me that there's a PE header residing inside of memory. So at this point now, effectively, what I've been able to do is do that in-mass collection step that first step, identify an anomaly, and that leads into an indicator of compromise, which is what I just got to now. Now from here, I can go into very targeted collection and go say, I wanna take a look, or I wanna do a forensic grab, or I wanna dump the virtual address space of this specific process and turn it in, into traditional forensics and IR over the wire. Or I can go and engage. I could kill the process in this case, kill bandwidth L, across the network, or I could take a look and say, what other, uh, what other machines in this operating environment have something similar, and do a larger sweep of the target. This is where it gets dictated based off of what each organization feels comfortable with. Give me one second.
So what I'm showing you right here is there was bandwidth L. Good, it's nice and big up there. There's bandwidth L. Um, that's the actual collection. So it's showing me what was residing in memory at this specific time that I collected. And so as I scroll down here, I can see that there's an MZ header with execute read write permissions. So for those of you that don't do live memory analysis, in ev pretty much every case of a, so a sophisticated, not nation state, sophisticated adversary, which most of them are, what they'll try to do is move themselves into memory. And once they're in memory, then they're able to bypass your current security products that are deployed, your persistent agents, and it allows for them to maintain continuous access. So what this is showing is that there's code sitting inside of memory at this point in time. Now, if anyone's used volatility malfine, this is basically an apples to apples comparison to volatility's malfine uh, type functionality. Now from here, I can dive in and I can go and kill that specific process, or I can grep through memory and say, show me everything that's in memory, and then I can push that out across the enterprise looking for, for hacker handles and things like that that are inside there. So inside root 9b, the way we define hunt operations, and I'm seeing I'm running out of time. So the way we define hunt operations, again, is interactive operations, putting the human back at the center, using an agentless type capability to actively engage, right? And so this is where, in my opinion, all organizations need to move themselves, or else they are just going to continue deploying static defenses and hoping for the best and we will never win that way. So with that, I'd like to, C and I have five minutes left, I'd like to open it up for uh, questions. Oh. Oh. I think we have a couple. <laughs>